Hey everybody, it's Maiden Voyage, Tech Talk Tuesday, number 182. I'm over here at YouTube. Just trying to get the camera to work here. Let me know if you see me. Wait for a few folks to come on. A little bit slow start, but first time I did YouTube, nope, first time I did the uh, Tech Talk Tuesday 181 or 182 episodes ago, there was a kind of a slow start, and I was all struggling with the camera trying to make people come on there, and uh, I see you got a few people signing up. I'll keep jawing for a minute and uh, flip over and show you. Thank you, Jackie, for your assistance. Uh, so far, so good. We're learning how to do YouTube. Um, my YouTube channel is, I think it's a, at George Bryce Star. <clears throat> I mean, camera's wobbling a lot. There you go. That's where you should be finding me. I got some info and some stuff I want to share with you guys tonight. Uh, it's, over, it's 6 o'clock over in the Eastern. Hey, man. Hey, Charlie. Thank you for signing up, Charlie. I feel almost complete now that Charlie signed up. That is great. Of course, we'll retar record, record this and, uh, and post it again like we normally do, but I just wanted you guys to know that for the sake of us having a better platform for the future of Tech Talk Tuesday with a full, you know, a... Uh, the screen turned in landscape is so much better than it was on the uh, Facebook was only letting me stand it up this way and it was a narrow screen and it was it was tough but I'm gonna get the camera in the right place when I start talking to you about stuff but thank you all for tuning in um, and and please understand that it's my style to shake the camera and, and, and screw around with it because I'm not real good at that stuff yet hey you made it on time Chris good thank you guys for Clocking in, thank you for signing up. Uh, this is going to be great. Uh, we're going to we're going to grow this this um, venue by sharing the information that I've learned or that I think I know about for the last forty or fifty years, and I enjoy sharing it with you guys. And this is a new a new way. Hey Noah, thank you for signing on. Um, if you're new, uh, let me know if you can hear me. Okay, first, uh, give me somebody, give me a little feedback that you can hear me loud and clear, or you need me to adjust the volume accordingly. There's Jay. Thank you, Jay. Just keep delivering that gold, Joel. Yeah, thank you. Loud and clear. That's good and quick. Boy, that is way faster than the other venue we were using. Um, Thank you, guys. Wow, that's quick. So we might be able to do a little bit better job communicating with you guys over time, you know, by uh, being a little bit quicker, me going out and you coming in, that we might be able to, when I get a minute, we'll do a question and answer session. Might not be today. Yeah, thank you, Chris, for the love of the big screen. Yeah, it's going to be a lot better. Hey, Ron. Um, I wanted to say a real quick shout out to... A lot of you saw on the internet a few months ago where the B-17 bomber went down at a show in Texas. The name of the bomber was the Texas Raiders, and I was very fortunate to get to spend some time on that plane this, this past year. Um, I got to hang out and get to enjoy two different B-17s. It's a passion of mine. As I was growing up as a boy, I was drawing airplanes, and always wanted to know more model. I built model planes. I wanted to know more about the planes and they were really mechanical marvels. And we lost Texas Raiders. A guy um, had a mid-air collision with, a, with an old fighter plane. And um, I was fortunate enough to get a, a couple decals, a t-shirt. And also I bought a souvenir 50 cal. They had belts and belts of these for the waist gunner, the tail gunner, uh, the turret, um, the ball turret guy, the guy in the nose, and several of the guns on the ship. And this is an old 50 caliber 
I'm telling you, boxes and boxes of them. But I just found this in the house a little while ago, and I said, you know, my friends that love engines and we love hot rod Harleys and, and small block, big block Chevys and Fords and Chryslers, I, so many people are also passionate about these um, majestic mechanical marvels and a B-17 bomber. Look it up when you have time. Don't do it right now while we're doing Tech Talk, but look it up, and I want you to look and see about the firepower they had, but they were used heavily in World War II. Um, and I just wanted to say a shout out to the people that lost their lives on that and also how they had shared that passion for that with other folks. I did get to enjoy since, since I was on Texas Raiders, the one that was uh, Memphis, no, it was called uh, Motor City. I think it was Motor City. I think it was, yeah. Bombardier on a B-17, yeah. But anyway, this is Tech Talk Tuesday, number 182. So I'm going to tell you guys, this means that I've done this every Tuesday, Tech Talk Tuesday. I've done this every Tuesday. Wow, look at those fingers. I've been working. Tech Talk Tuesday, 182. That means 182 weeks in a row that we've done Tech Talk. And I spend 20 or 30 minutes talking about things I think I know. And um, it's on YouTube now, yeah. Okay, so I'm through rambling. Um, I wanted to tell you that I also have some information that I was... Oh, let's let's catch up on Blue 5.0 right quick. I got to tell you all how close he is. Blue 5.0 is really close. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move the camera a little bit. Please bear with me with the noise. Hey, John. Hey, 302 Road King. Okay, I got to tell you guys, this is not the same as it was the last several times I posted this. This has spark plugs in it. The pipe is welded. It is permanently attached now. I uh, got the back end done, got the chain tight. Yes, I'm going to clean this up and paint this eventually, but I want to get it started. And I wanted to share with you guys that I've got all the plumbing and all the wiring done, I believe, that when I put fluids in this and put the gas tank on so I can plug the switches in, I think this is ready to go. I got to put the plug wires on yet, but I have them here. And I've got two more plugs, but I'm gonna check, make sure that the engine spins over good and I can make check the oil pressure and make sure the oil light goes out. But this is 145 cubic inches. And my car friends, my V8 friends will understand this is a four 600 bore and a 4.375 stroke. We've got the clutch all done. Like I said, I got all the all this stuff ready, and it's it's an ex-police bike, and I'm expecting it to make 200 horsepower. And of course, I'm not going to tour with it, but I am going to ride it. I'm going to ride it around my hometown here, where I'm where I live now here in uh, Tennessee, and it's got a muffler. Yep, I got deleted oil lines. Let's show you that. They are deleted. Let's see if I can get it to focus over here. Maybe it'll focus on my hand. I don't know. But anyway, yeah, I've got a bypass from the front of the oil pump a back around to the transmission where that goes back into the tank. The oil tank is back here. And I got a hose coming out of the front here. And I've got it running around and back into the tank. So I'm bypassing the oil that goes through the oil cooler and I'm bypassing where it goes through the cylinder head cooling. This is like a twin cam to me. Now, my last two uh, twin cam uh, nine second hot rod bikes didn't have oil coolers or head cooling. So I'm just going with the old school uh, air cooled with oil cooling up here. I'm not gonna run, I'm not gonna run the, the, the lines that Harley put on the late model ones to try and uh, let them have some more compression for EPA and uh, they, they tried to cool the head so they could sell them internationally um, and try and maintain some compression ratio and have, I think they had to have oil cooling and water cooling on those heads in order to sell them in Europe, but I could be wrong. That's just an opinion, by the way, which is most of my stuff here. Okay, let's get off of that. Anyway, it's ready to fire maybe tomorrow, maybe the next day. I'm not in a rush, I've been working on it on, you know, every week since May when I have time and I finally got all my ducks in a row, maybe it's ready to go. So, all right. 
Yeah, me too, John. I don't like the oil lines above there. Also, listen, I want to say that. that All that stuff above those heads up there, they had all the oil lines over the heads, and I take this apart. I take my hot rod apart. I'm an engine guy. I'm a mechanic. I like working on these because they're easy to work on. But look, when you got those manifolds over the heads and you got all those lines and all that crap, it's not easy to take apart. It's not easy to work on. It's not easy to service. But this motorcycle is built to take apart and put together and take apart and put together because we're learning about how big it is, how many RPM it's going to turn. I've got giant valves in it. I've got a giant 615 race cam in it and um, a lot of experimental parts and I'm excited to see what it will do. Cylinder heads are ported really big, the valves are really big and it should rev up good. I should be able to struggle finding a rev limiter to go high enough to find peak power. So if I'm if it has a rev, if, if the ECU built in from uh, Techno Research or Power Vision or whoever I use or right now I'm trying to figure it out, but I'm gonna start it up with the stock ECU. It's got uh, 8.4 injectors in it so it's going to be too big of an engine for the stock tune in the ECU, and it's going to be too big of an injector, so I'm hoping that will kind of balance out to where it won't blow smoke when I crank it up, and it won't be uh, farting and popping and banging. So, yeah, 52, 52 for sure. It's going to be way higher than that. I'm, I'm thinking 7,500 to 8,000 is what my goals are. All right, I get a lot of questions from people asking me about camshafts and they and they ask questions that i know here let me try and get this camera just a little better for this glare but i know that they don't really know but they ask because they read about it and i wanted to all of us to be a little bit more um number savvy with camshaft stuff so i'm going to talk for real quick for a minute i'm going to tell you when you when you look on the internet or you look at your cam card or somebody tells you what their cam has i'm talking about on a v8 a uh, LS, a big block Chevy, small block Chevy, a forward Chrysler. I don't care if it's a four valve, two valve. They're going to have an in, uh, intake valve opening number, and they're going to have an intake valve closing number. And this will be, that number will be recorded or listed at 50 thou lift. That means right off the seat, 20, 20 degrees after, uh, bef excuse me, 20 degrees, this is like a one, 20 degrees before top dead center, the intake valve would open, and then it would go 180 degrees through the intake stroke, and then after it gets to the bottom, it's gonna go another 40 degrees, and that will give us 20 opening and 40 closing, plus 180 of the intake stroke. So you add this together and this together to get 60, and then you add 180 degrees to it, and that gives you 240 degrees duration at 50. Now, on the exhaust side, they'll have an opening number will be first, the exhaust valve opening, which this one will be 40 degrees before bottom, and it will close at 20 degrees after top dead center. So exhaust valve open and exhaust valve close, plus 180 degrees of the exhaust stroke will also give you a 40 plus 20 equals 60 plus 180 equals 240. So this is like one of my competitor's cams where they have the same lobe on the intake and exhaust. But you guys know that when you see a cylinder head or a combustion chamber on a on any engine, I don't care if it's a two valve. If it's a two valve, it'll have one valve, one exhaust valve that big, and it'll have an intake valve that big. So this valve's small, and it goes and it has uh, sonic pressure, way big high pressure pushing the exhaust out. So it needs a smaller valve than the intake. Also, if we have a choice on the, a normally aspirated engine, we have a choice of figuring out what valve size we want. We would always put a bigger intake in because the intake can only come in, it can only take air in through the barometer, the atmosphere pushing the air in from outside and it, and it will be in the combustion chamber. And of course the spark plug could go here. And then if you have that as the case, we don't have anything other than the barometer, which is 2992 at sea level to make the air go in the engine, so we have to have a giant intake valve. And if you go more than 180 degrees of intake stroke, you're gonna have some reversion, and you're gonna crash the valve into the pistons if you don't have enough TDC lift. So we, we're real careful with how soon we open the intake valve, and then we trap the air in when we want it in there so we can make the power where we want it by closing somewhere between 20 after bottom and 80 after bottom to get the mixture trapped in the cylinder plus 180. So 
What I wanted to tell you about that is this is not the kind of camshafts I sell or use. I would always use an intake lobe for getting air in the engine, and I would use an exhaust lobe to get the air, the spent gases out of the engine. So I would more likely have a 60 opening and maybe a 20 closing. So I can keep the same intake lobe and then I can make this right here, this would be an 80 and a 180, that would give me a 260. And I want you guys to be savvy of how I get these numbers because now I'm opening the exhaust valve a full 20 degrees sooner than I was with this other cam and I am closing it at the same time, but I did jack the duration up from 240 to 260. So now this more fits in line with having a big intake and a little bit smaller exhaust because I have more time to get the exhaust out and I have more pressure getting the exhaust out. So whatever it takes, and this is where we mess up reading the internet and listening to experts because let me tell you, my experience being around for a long time, I know a lot of folks on here that are really smart. I know a lot of folks that aren't on here that are really smart. I know a lot of folks that are so smart they don't need to watch my show, they don't need to talk to me, and they already know all they're gonna know. And I'm gonna give you a couple tips. One, if you already know everything, you will never learn anymore. But if you don't know everything, then you need to consider some information from somebody else. And they may, please take it with a grain of salt because they might be wrong. And I read the same forums and the same internet you guys do, and I see so much bad information. And it's based on what somebody said. What I have going on here, you guys, is experience based on results that I have personally lived through. I've paid for it, I've caught it on fire, I've blown it up, I've run over it, I have crashed it, I have made payments. So, let me just say this. There's a lot of bad information out there, and I'm not gonna step on anybody's toes, but I just want you to know just because it's on the internet or just because it's on some formula, that doesn't make it the truth. That's just this. what I'm telling you is an opinion. And I believe that you need a different cam for the intake and a different cam for the exhaust in order to for the engine to run the best. But I wrote this to remind me right here. Dog barking. Now, I know that sounds kind of dumb, but I'm going to make some kind of analogy here. My engine, my engine, your engine, the expert's engine, and the guy that doesn't know what he's doing engine, and the dyno operator, and the shop owner, and the guys with the fast race cars and the slow race cars and, and NASCAR and Pro Stock, they all have, their engine is, is barking like a dog. You ever had a dog that barks and he's just barking and barking and barking and you say, oh, I know what he wants. He always barks when he wants this. And you give it to him what it is you think he needs. And he looks at it and he keeps barking. Well, let me tell you, he wasn't asking for what you were giving him. He is barking about something else. And your engine and their engine and our engine and everybody's engine is going to be telling you what it wants. It's going to tell you by how bad it runs, how good it runs. It's going to tell you by how cool or how hot, how much noise it makes, how much not noise it doesn't make. It's going to tell you about the horsepower, the dyno sheet. It's going to tell you about the time slip, seat of the pants, all the things that matter of what your engine's trying to tell you. And it's telling you something, but you are might be deaf to it, or you might be blind to it, or you might also not even know the language that your engine is trying to tell you. That's where the experience and the instrumentation and all the things that we measure nowadays, we didn't measure much back in the day. I'm telling you, we loaded up, we built engines and ran them on our little dyno. We had a little Stuska dyno that it was so hard to run. I had to, I had to open the water and, and give it the throttle, open the water to pull, pull the engine down. I wanted to find out how much power it had at 8,000 RPM. I would open the water valve and put the throttle and open and open and open, and I'd try and get the tachometer to come in about 8,000 RPM and then get it wide open and then get the RPM leveled out at 8,000 RPM, and then the torque meter would say, say 100 foot-pounds, and then I would have to use the 8,000 RPM times 100 foot-pounds you know, times the 5252, the math, and it would tell me how much power it had. And that's really hard to do when you gotta know a sweep 
You gotta know 8,000, 9,000, 10,000. You also wanna know 7,000 RPM. And you have to do, a, we had to test at every RPM and then we had to write down those numbers and then build a curve based on RPM and based on power. And it was so slow, but we blew up a lot. We ran over a lot. We broke head gaskets, we broke pistons, we broke timing chains. We, we just, I mean, the pistons, just so hard to learn. And then when you would get through doing the sweep with the Stutzka dyno with a steady state, we would do 7,000, 8,000, 9,000, 10,000, 11,000, and we would plot that power curve out. Then you could do like a leak down on the engine or do a compression check on it and see if it was still in good shape. Then you pull the valve covers and check the lash and one of the valves would have sunk or, or got bigger lash or less lash and all of a sudden you'd have less, uh, you'd have a leak down issue and now you gotta rebuild the engine and find out what was wrong. And when did it go wrong? Did it go wrong at 7,000, 8,000, 9,000? Why does the power curve have a dip? What did you do or what did the engine do where it had a power dip? It was so hard to learn at that rate, you guys, that it was unbelievable. But it's built an opportunity for us to understand more nowadays about the dog barking. Now, I know, I know that's a dumb analogy, but I just wanted to share with you guys, how do I know what I know about this stuff? Well, all engines in the world, all normally aspirated two valve, four valve engines that are high performance, not EPA certified street engines like our new Harley, like a new Milwaukee 8, the intake valve opens after TDC and it closes close to the bottom. So it has a round, let's see what we have. Let's say it opens at 10 after bottom and it closes at 20 after bottom dead center. 10 after, so that makes this 10. So that's 190 degrees. How do I know that? It's so minus 10 is after, plus 20 after, 10 after TDC plus 20 after bottom, plus 180. That was 190 degrees. That's what the stock engine has. It has no overlap. It has negative overlap. That means that the intake valve opens after TDC. So the piston's already going down on the intake stroke before the intake valve opens. All that is to have power at 1,000 RPM and to have fuel economy at part throttle and for the engine to meet EPA standards, which is strangling our high performance and hot rod industry. So if I was going to tell you all engines, they all open the valve between 40 and 10 before TDC. All intakes. So all intakes are within a 30-degree swing. Pro stock, super high RPMs, horrible uh, breathing heads open the intake valve at 40 before top, and the best breathing four valves open around 10 before top. So there's about a 30 degree swing for all camshafts, for all engines in the world on their opening number. And the opening number is not that important to me, but what I look at on this is what this does to the TDC lift and how far the valve is open when the piston comes up to the top and how soon the piston turns around and goes back down and how much lift I need to have as soon as possible. Also, I want to tell you with this, one thing that we have learned. The exhaust closing, that's the other small number that dictates um, overlap. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Okay, so we got all exhaust valves uh, close between 10 after a top and 40 after top. So there is a 30 degree swing and exhaust valve timing on the closing. Intake valve opening, exhaust valve closing. So that means all overlap. If, the, if you open the soonest and you close the latest, you got 80 overlap on your engine. I've seen lots and lots of Hemi cars, old school, big block Chevys, had 40 and 40, and they had, 100, they had 80, 40 and 40 is 80 overlap. So 40 before top dead center and 40 after Top dead center gives you 80 degrees overlap. That is a really poor running, old timey, old school, 327, 283, 383. The old Fords and Chryslers, they, they open the intake valve too soon and they close the exhaust valve too late. And there was a lot of wasted motion going on there and, and a lot of lost pressure. So 
I wanted to tell you those two numbers are only a 30-degree swing from the best to the worst. Between 40 and 10 on opening and between 10 and 40 on the exhaust closing. I don't know if that makes any sense to you, but hopefully we can pull this full circle in a minute. Now, for the big stuff, this is what really matters. The exhaust valve opening. So all engines. This is really crazy. This is an opinion of all engines. Two valve, four valve. I'm going to say... <sighs> the exhaust valves open between, uh, oh, 90, 100, 100, I'm going to change colors because that one's drying up on me, 100 before bottom, which is 80 after top, and about 30 before bottom. So this is a giant span there's a 70 degree difference in the world in engines from when the exhaust valve opens this is i nope e v o you can see there is way wider spread issues with one that you wish you could put a bigger exhaust valve in it you wish you could get more exhaust out because you're getting so much intake in, so you have to open the exhaust valve way, way, way sooner, okay? When it's really good, four valve, super high efficiency, you might see one that's got really big exhaust valves, like it might have two big exhaust valves. You might open it at 30 before uh, bottom, but that would be pretty wide. I'd say this is probably closer to 40 as a good number. So if it's 40, Let's say that changes this to 60. The spread. And then this is the this is the second most important number in cam timing in my world, in my opinion of what I work on. And the third, the most important one of all is the intake valve closing. And that's the one everybody wants to know about because they this is when they start talking about. Uh, cranking compression ratio and corrected compression ratio and all that stuff that's on some math formula that somebody has on a software program, blah, blah, blah. But so this number is another one that's really wide. If you've got a really nice high efficiency four valve, big valves, and you only want to close the valve, let's say you're going to close the valve like my, my 30, 30 cam closes at 20. I'm going to say 30 just to make it round numbers because I've got uh, the F35A closes at 35 and the 3030 closes at 25. So that's right here. And then a real high RPM, poorly flowed cylinder head that doesn't move much air and it's very restrictive. They might close this at, say, 70. So there's that 40 degrees difference again. So this one closes at 30 after bottom, the best heads and low RPM engines, and then the highest RPM engines with the worst heads close at 70 after bottom. So the trapping distance difference here is 40. These numbers dictate duration. Let's just go there. Let's say we open the intake valve at 10 before, and we close the intake valve at 40 after bottom, and then we add the 180 degrees to it. That gives us Let's see, that's 50, 180. What does that give us? 50 and 180. That's 230. I don't want to write it down wrong. A little bit brain fart. I know you know it because you're standing there and you're not live. Plus 10 plus 180 equals 230. Okay, so that's a 230 duration intake cam. Everybody knows this. It opens at 10 before the top, closes at 40 after bottom, plus 180 degree intake stroke makes 230 degrees. That's a good intake cam, okay? Now, what is the lobe center of this if you have these? Well, you're going to take this 230 and you divide it by 2, which gives us, here we go, 230 degrees duration divided by Two equals 115 minus the opening, minus the opening, 15 equals. Mm -mm. Sorry, I hit the wrong button. 230 divided by 2 equals 115 minus 10 equals 105. So this lobe center on this cam is 105. Lobe center. This is lobe 
center. Now, I just want you to know that the lobe center is cool and duration is cool, but these are the numbers that make it. This is not what you what I shot for, and this is not what I shot for. I want this. I want it to open here so I don't clang the valves into the pistons. I want it to close here so I can trap the mixture to make the horsepower where I want it. On the exhaust side, let's say that I open it at 60 and I close it at 10, and that will give me 70 and 180. That gives me 2 plus 180. That gives me 250. All right, that's a 250 degrees duration, and how do I know that? I'm going to take... 60 and 10 plus 180. 60, put this over here where we can do it. 60 plus 10 plus 180 equals 250. All right, take 250 divided by 2 equals 125 minus 10. Minus the 10 on the closing number. So you get 125 minus 10 equals 115 lobe center. So this exhaust cam's on a 115 lobe center. Does that make sense, everybody? We got the intake, 230 duration, the exhaust 250 duration, intake's on 105 lobe center, and the exhaust is on 115 lobe center because we open it at 60 before bottom, closing at 10 after top, and you want to know the lobe separation, and it's not what you shot for it as a result. You take 105 and 115, take the lobe center of the intake and the lobe center of the exhaust. You go... 105 plus 115 equals 220 divided by 2 equals 110. So the lobe separation on this camshaft is 110 lobe separation. All right. Tech Talk Tuesday. Number 182, man. That was fun. It was live. It was on YouTube. First try. Thank you all for watching. May God bless y'all. Look, I'm going to try this again on 183 next week. I, I got a lot that I want to share. I kind of fumbled a little bit tonight because I was trying to be on a new platform with a new camera angle. And uh, I really enjoyed it. And it was great to share. I hope you like this wide angle better. I know I do. Um, and also this is on. So, hey, at... George Bryce Star, where you're looking right now on YouTube. If you uh, subscribe to this channel, you will get a notification when I go live. And I'm going to do other live pieces now that I have created a platform on YouTube, uh, George Bryce Star. I will do some little short shorts during the week when I think of a tech tip to share with you. And it will give you, if you, if you, <laughs> thank you, Alan. If, if you're, if you're subscribed, you will get notifications that I'm going to do something. So thank you all. And um, I enjoyed the talk. And let me share more with you next week. Give me another chance. Okay. Thank you all very much. May God bless. Good night.